Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the WealthyHomeowner.ca, Canada's authority on home ownership. Welcome back to the show, Ross. And thanks for having me back, Jim. Ross, last week the Canadian Real Estate Association released their forecast for this year which stated home sales would break 700000 and prices would top, on average, six hundred sixty-five grand. Carmen, a realtor in Vaughan, Ontario, asks, CREA claimed over 700,000 homes would be traded this year, and the average would top 665000 Should I be selling homes to my family who want to buy right now? Well, Carmen, a, real, Carmen, a realtor, so probably the most active profession that we get uh, we get uh, comments from is uh, our realtors. I mean, it, I, I I believe they are actually uh, in terms of jobs, the jobs that I know of, even with uh, the wealthy homeowner, uh, it's really uh, I believe they're the highest industry that's represented in our membership. Now I believe a lot of them signed up to try to get access to our information, uh, and and ended up doing it so that they. Uh, they can do something about themselves. This is what, what Carmen has never been trained in as a realtor because uh, those leading <laughs> our realtors themselves uh, are clueless to what's going on. When Korea came out with that report last year, Carmen, uh, or excuse me, uh, last week, you, you don't understand how absurd that report really was to give those two kind of forecasts because what they're basically saying is two things that were polar opposites of one another. They were saying that sales are going to increase 150,000 in Canada this year. Previous record they claimed was 550, which the record was never hit, by the way, but we'll just go with their, their number of 550. And now now they're forecasting for, for 700,000, like you said there. 700, that means 150,000 additional sales. Okay, so if for that to take place, you would need to have an average selling price at the end of the year of around $735,000, okay? So the way that the sales work, the way the sales progress, the way the sales chain works, the way, way the multiplicity of sales works, the only way you can have 700000 sales is if a whole bunch of first-time buyers jump into the market because they have to buy a whole bunch of low-priced homes to get that market rolling, to pick up that extra 150,000 sales. Look, even if the sales chain was five links long, to make up 150,000, that means you need 30,000 extra first-time buyers. 30,000 extra first-time buyers have to jump in the market on top of those that are already jumping in it um, right now or the number that jumped in last year. Now, 30,000 additional first-time buyers means that you're going to drive the average selling price down because in the months where those buyers are jumping into the market, their share of sales is going to skyrocket and it would have to skyrocket to a level never before recorded by organized real estate. It would have to exceed the ratio that happened last April in Canada when the Canadian real, the average selling price dropped to 488000 So you would first of all have to see that huge drop in price. And then you would see such a historic increase it would make what you've seen since uh, April uh, since July of last year through till February um, a joke it would have to end up at the average of seven around seven hundred thirty five thousand if this seven hundred thousand dollar plateau was reached now it's already absurd that they're trying to say that the average house is going to increase again this year up to six hundred and sixty five thousand dollars like like it's insane. They don't understand what, what they're saying. 
the way that we look at it, folks, is this way. The first two months of this year, the average selling price is probably somewhere is around $648,000. So what they're saying is, for the rest of the year, for the first time in history, those months are going to be higher. Those months are going to be higher, on average, than what we've already reported this year. You have to look into context what these two last months were. These last two months were the end of a declining sales market in Canada. Okay, We measure housing markets, as I've said in the show before, Jim, totally differently than the way that, that uh, anyone else does. So when they're reporting sales are increasing and hitting records, we're actually tra- tracking them as negative because we measure what's called the pace of sales. Now, if you're not measuring the pace of sales, then you never know what's actually happening in a housing market. You're going to instead look at have it, use the opinion of someone not, not trained in housing markets who are quoting um, sales, sales numbers. Sales numbers don't matter. It's the pace of sales that you're always tracking because this pace of sales, generally speaking, is a negative about eight months of the year, and it's positive about four. That's how you get those high house prices in those four positive months, and you get lower prices in those other declining months. It's why those peak prices happen immediately after the market turns. Now, this is no one-off, folks. This has happened every year as far back as data goes, exists. But you have to be able to read the pace of sales. So, Carmen, this, this, is, this is what I advice I would give you as a realtor because you mentioned family, your family, okay? Back in 1988, 1988, I was ha- only had my real estate license for the first my first year. I'd only sold maybe 100 houses back then. And my dad came into the office. And you got to remember, my dad was like the boss. He's, as, as we referred to him back then, the legend. Um, he said, we're going to quit selling houses. I mean, my, my mouth dropped to the floor. What do you mean, dad? We're going to quit quit selling houses you know things are really going good for me here you know i'm not what do you mean i'm not going to sell no you're going to work on listings you're not going to be working on buyers and i said well dad buyers right now i mean they're the hottest commodity you get a buyer it's like getting money in your pocket he said well ross he said you know we're at the we're at the end of the lot he didn't call it a cycle back then i'm trying to think what it trying to think what the wording he used but he says we're 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 at we're at the end now good times the end yeah. of the good times. <laughs> yeah, and he said you're going to you're going to see prices go up, and you don't want to have your clients buying houses now and then paying the consequence two or three years down the road. So you have to understand, Carmen. My dad at the time was the number one selling sales rep in Canada for Remax. Okay, that that is who I learned from. I didn't learn from someone who was inexperienced. I learned from one of the top minds in the real estate industry at that time. He instructed us that we weren't going to sell houses anymore. So we didn't. Okay, we, we, we still worked with buyers, but we weren't actively out there soliciting buyers. And any of our own clients, we were telling them, no, you shouldn't be buying right now. What this means, Carmen, is, is that while the housing prices were going up at their highest level in the fall of 1988 and into the spring of 1989, my dad was telling me, hey, Ross, you can't be selling houses to buyers. I mean, my dad was, everybody in the office was going around the office and, you know, look at Alan, you made a mistake, you made a mistake, you made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake because a year and a half later, he was right. And he showed me how it was working at the time. Now, again, data was different at that time. We're talking about the old days, the early days of DOS computers and dot matrix printers, gas plasma screens. I think there were like 640 uh, pixels. I mean, that's how bad it was back then. You used to have to wait. I think it was it was like five or six days you had just to put your listing into the MLS computer because it was brand new at that time. And again, working at the Realtors Association of Hamilton, Burlington, they were the very first real estate board in North America to have a computerized MLS. Okay, way ahead of Vancouver, way ahead of uh, of uh, Toronto. Okay, it was always a cutting edge real estate board in Canada for many reasons. But anyways. Um, so we stopped selling houses. It took my dad, it took a year and a half before agents in the office were coming up to my dad and apologize. But we, you know something, Carmen, we didn't have a client that, ha- that, that lost out. In 2007, 2007, my dad had already been retired and I quit selling houses to buyers. And I was walking to the office as the agents going around bragging about the houses that they were selling to their buyers. About how much money the ho- guy that they had sold the house to last month had made. And I'm sitting there, I'm saying, well, this is like 1988 all over again, folks. What happened? 2008 arrived in the Great Recession. If, 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 uh, 
Carney hadn't pulled us out of that hole with those ridiculously low interest rates that he instituted. If Mr. Flaherty hadn't dropped, uh, had, had the, uh, amount of mortgage you could borrow increasing as much as he allowed it to increase, we never would have pulled ourselves out of that recession. So the small declines that we recorded, okay, it wasn't really what happened. But the beautiful thing for me was I didn't sell anybody in a house that had lost any money on their houses. My buyers had not lost any money in their houses. Carmen, if you look at a real estate market the way that we look at real estate market, which is nothing like you've been taught in real estate school, which is nothing like you've listened for, learned from the Canadian Real Estate Association, who actually repeats things that are so hilarious in, 19, in the 1980s, they would have been laughed out of every real estate brokerage in Canada. Well, anybody who had sold houses anyway. Um, you, you, you believe these things. I'm telling you right now, Carmen, right? Right now, the housing market right today is exactly the same as what it was in October of 2019, except in October of uh, 2019, the market was moving. The pace of sales was in a totally different direction than what it is today. Your 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 family members are the people that you're going to have to see, Carmen, for the next uh, five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years. There were families that were wiped out who bought houses between 1988 and when the market was realized as being corrected in 1990. Literally wiped out, Carmen. They were decades coming back from that. You don't want to have your family get caught with that. You, what you need to do is you need to look at, you, you mentioned Vaughn, which ironically, it's, it's one of the most hilarious housing markets in Canada because uh, the way the housing stock has been uh, evolved over the last uh, 20 years and the way that housing stock comes into the MLS system through a typical behavioral pattern that has been followed for decade after decade after decade is the only reason that you're hearing about the prices that you're hearing about. It's the only reason your local MLS is allowed to create as much house price illusion as they are. You're a member of the Toronto Real Estate Board if you're in Vaughan. Um, don't, don't let your family be those, pe- be those people who are buying at the peak or the crest of the housing market. There's very, very little risk for them holding on. You, they could be Literally, if they are, if they're, if any of them are having a baby today, it could be the, till their, the baby's having their uh, 13th birthday before they're able to recover from this. I'm not telling you when it's going to happen, Carmen. I'm not t- going to tell you how it's going to happen. What I'm telling you is this. It's impossible to reach 700,000 sales and only see the average price reach 665,000. We are already into the first two months of the year. You're already at about six 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 fifty something right now, Ross. My question is: Are there thirty thousand low end properties available right now for people who would get into the market for the first time? And what about the tens of thousands of people who have lost jobs who intended to buy a home, say, a year ago, but uh, have lost their jobs and now can't? Are there thirty thousand low end properties for them to snap up right now? Uh, yes. Okay. And, 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 and now, yes, Jim, if they're willing to move. So, my, so the, you have to understand my, my answer when I'm giving an answer like this, it's, uh, across Canada. Okay. So I'm we can give- forget about Toronto and, and Vancouver. No such thing as quote low end. <laughs> That's correct. So a low end house in Vancouver is a one bedroom, small one bedroom condo or a lower quality two bedroom condo somewhere in the city, which most people would turn their noses up upon, okay? That's just reality. Um, when, when, you, when you make the comment you made, well, to me, I'm going to have a cutoff of around $400,000 in Canada today, Jim, based on what you just said. <laughs> There's 49,000 houses for sale in Canada today that are under $400,000, Jim. But That's they're not in Vancouver and they're not in Toronto. Correct. And they never were. They weren't in 1988. And they weren't in 2007. This is what people, for some reason, are believing. Look, as a city becomes bigger and denser, that means your property pyramid, your property ladder, gets taller and taller and taller. And the steps that you have to take get bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, you know, we're talking tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars bigger. I live in a city called Burlington, Ontario. We have a really nice subdivision in South End called Roseland. Okay, now in Roseland, you're not going to get into Roseland for under two million. 
Okay, and even at two million, it's going to be an older house that you're going to renovate. It, you would be more more comfortable if you're around the five million dollar mark. Okay, now I understand for Vancouver, people say, "Hey, that's like a regular single detached house out here in some parts." It's not, but I mean, that's what they would say. Not everybody's entitled to live in Roseland in Burlington. People who are top income earners, people who are in the top ten percent of earners in this country, can't afford to live in Roseland. And they never assume that they will. When you're talking about Vancouver and you're talking about Toronto, you're talking about the Roseland or the Beverly Hills of Canada. And as the as Canadian population continues to grow and your household formation continues to grow and city planners continue to want to suggest and CMHC that densification is the answer to this. All you're going to do is drive your property ladder taller and taller and taller in these cities. Politicians, Jim, are not willing to make the political decision that is required, which means telling people we have a choice to make and what choice are we going to make. In British Columbia, Vancouver, they decided it was okay for foreign buyers to buy up single-family homes. They decided that was okay until it was too late, and then they changed the rules, and now they're trying to pretend that that rule had something to do or didn't have something to do with it. There's still no data available from anybody. You have uh, academics having all these opinions with no conclusive evidence that withstands a peer review. Whatever happened to the scientific method, Jim, I don't know. But they're just talking falsehoods. They're simply saying things to get reelected. Oh, we're going to help with affordability. No, you're not. All you're going to do is define affordability by a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller house because that's the only thing that you can build that's affordable. I mean, I don't think the Canadian public even understands because they don't talk about it, how much the cost of building a home has changed in the last year, just in the last year. The materials to build a house probably are up 35% just in the last year. So obviously, if just the materials are up, that's going to have to be compensated for in the new houses that are being built. Now, they're going to go back down because of supply and demand on uh, on building materials. But right now, that's the way that it is. So when you hear politicians telling you the density, oh, laneway housing, oh, yeah, right. Sure, laneway housing is the quickest way to decrease affordability in your community. Because what an, a laneway home is, is a home that is probably somewhere around 50% of the peak price on the street where it's located. So in other words, if the houses in the street are $2 million, a laneway house is probably going to be valued around a million. Okay, well, if you build a million-dollar house, that means the quality of your housing stock increases and the average value of a home actually increases. Nothing to do with the MLS house price pyramid. Nothing about the fact that house prices don't change in 31 days. Simply, the average quality of a house increases. If you build a whole bunch of 400 square foot one bedrooms, condos, then the average quality of your housing stock decreases. Except that nobody wants to live in a 400 square foot condo for the rest of their life. Well, some people do, but it's such a, your outliers. It's such a small percentage. And I'm not even critical of that. I think people could live quite happily in a 400-square-foot house. They do in New York City, quite happily, because you adjust to that as a mindset. And whatever your mindset is, that, that's what you believe is acceptable. Ross, take a look at what people live in in Hong Kong. No Canadian would ever put up with that. No, no. I mean, you, 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 anybody today, the beautiful thing about today is, Jim, you can watch these three, uh, 4K virtual tours on YouTube, of all of these, ever, any city in, in, in the world, any, any tourist destination that you want to ha- look at. And when you look at these places, you have to step back and say, is that the, the type of lifestyle that you want to have? I mean, in Vancouver and Toronto, the politicians are going to have to make a decision. Can we move our farming for our citizens into other parts of the country where they can farm at a lower cost? In other words, are there, part, are, are there parts of the country in southern Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, southern Manitoba, um, where we can produce um, f- enough food for our people? Because you need to have those houses built somewhere. And you can't keep having your cake and eating it too. Relocate the University of British Columbia. 
Get them the heck out of there. It's the most expensive real estate in the country. And then you have Pete staffers, academics, at the University of British Columbia giving you all these opinions on why your housing prices are up, but they don't ever admit, oh, we happen to be sitting on the most valuable real estate in Canada, and we could build hundreds, maybe a 100,000 extra houses in that area. Simon Fraser, move it out. Move it out to Kelowna. Give that valuable real estate back to, back to your municipality. Golf courses. You know, maybe you can't have the golf course in town. Maybe you could have two parks out of that golf course and a, a large residential uh, complex built in there. These are all the discussions that no politician wants to deal with because they're going to be looking to get reelected in four years. You're not going to have a solution from elected officials whose only job in their mind is to get reelected. And I think, Jim, we're watching it right now with this COVID response of the last year. All these people are worried about is getting reelected. It's got nothing to do with delivering to the people who voted them in the right decision. It's just like they're so afraid of being outed as making a mistake that they're compromising us in the process. And Carmen in... Uh, in Navan, you simply have been compromised by the Canadian Real Estate Association since they first hired Greg Klump. Because I'll tell you, Carmen, no one believed when Klump was hired that what was going to take place took place. In Vancouver, too, wasted land, the SkyTrain Guideway. We have the Van City Building, which is a credit union, the biggest credit union in B.C. Their office block is built over top of a SkyTrain line. In New Westminster, they have apartment blocks and a shopping mall built over top the SkyTrain line. That's land that isn't being used for anything else except for a train that runs every few minutes. But if you build over top of it, you can put another 30, 40, 60, 70 stories of uh, housing on top of it. Yet, there's very little discussion about it. You don't have to take away agricultural land. There's this entire guideway. Uh, that's available for development, yet I don't hear a lot of chat about it. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, warnings are beginning to appear about mortgage debt and higher rates upon renewal. Nicole from Vancouver asks, A lot of prominent real estate people on Twitter, especially in Vancouver, have been tossing out words like debt jubilee. And by the way, Ross, she says, my husband and I love listening to your podcast. It's always so informative. So are we going to see some kind of a debt jubilee happen? This is another opinion that is becoming prevalent, and we're hearing it all the time, for people who don't understand the basics of homeownership math. There is no need in, in Canada today for any Canadian to be worried about needing a debt jubilee because that's not how homeownership math works. I understand that people haven't studied how homeowners deal with their, 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 uh, their housing costs and they don't understand the difference between today's world and the world that existed 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 and 40 years ago. When you look at debt in the context of the last 40 years, you don't see it the same way that you hear those opinionate, those opinions, uh, going on about it today. Look, the way that mortgage debt is structured today, $100,000 will only be $85,000, $84,000 in debt five years from now. So if you're a first time buyer buying your first home, for every $100,000 of mortgage that you have, Five years from now, you're only going to have $85,000. You've got a staggering $15,000 of mortgage that you've paid off. You've just put $15,000 in your house piggy bank. What that means is, is that 
five years from now, if interest rates go from today's rate and they increase three full percentage points, three, so in other words, you, you had a mortgage today at 1.99%, and now you're going to have a mortgage at, excuse me, two full percent, at 3.99%, okay, which you're not. Remember, folks, you're going to go from like 1.64% to 3.99%, but I'm just making it easier here. That's a, a, a two-fold per percentage point gain, um, which means that the posted rate would have to be somewhere around 6%. Um, all you would do is you would renegotiate your mortgage and move your amortization back up to 25 years on the renewal. So you had a 20-year renewal at the end of your first five years, but because of a calamity in things, you know, the worst thing at all, uh, the worst thing that they're talking about has happened and you haven't had any wage gains five years, over five years. And all you want to do is keep owning your home. The answer is simple. You simply in increase your amortization back to 25 years. Now you have to understand, even at 3.99%, re-upping your amortization to 25 years your mortgage payment's going to be identical to what it is today. Identical. Because you're now financing $84,000. And here's the beautiful thing, folks. Even if you forced, were forced to do that, the next five-year period, by the time you're ready to renew, renew your mortgage again, you only have a $73,000 mortgage. You've paid off 25% of your mortgage over the first 10 years you've owned it. In the, under the worst economic conditions in history, in the greatest effective interest rate increase in history, well, I guess I'd have to go back to the 21% uh, interest days of 1990 to, to calculate what the actual increase was in terms of uh, mortgage interest that you're paying. Um, and you still are only have 73. You paid off $27,000, 27% of the debt that you owed. You can then look at things again. This is why we always tell people you, you should be looking at 10-year mortgages on the first time that you buy a house in in the context of what you're able to get mortgage debt at right now. You can get a 10-year mortgage at 1.99%, under 2%. Why would you not take that? You're paying a little bit of interest premium for the security of not having to worry for the next 10 years. So what if everybody calls you an idiot because you took a 10-year term? So what if they tell you that? You don't have to worry for 10 years. You don't have to worry about a raise. As long as you've got a job, you just don't have to worry for 10 years. That means you pay an insurance premium. You pay a premium for that um, comfort, for not having to worry. The people who are talking about the, this debt jubilee are the same people who are talking about the debt to GDP ratio being an historic norm. And we just said here, we're pulling our head out. This is like saying a home buyer today is in worse shape than a home buyer in 1990. What world am I living in? Have you ever calculated the amount of mortgage debt, the amount of mortgage interest that we used to have to, well, now I know this is, was not an industry norm. So when you bought a house from us in the 80s and then, not, and then from any time from that period forward, we would sit you down and show you how much mortgage interest you were forecast to be paying because we would, we knew you were still going to buy the house. So we were so sure of our, our ability to sell you at home. We could tell you all the truth. We didn't have to hide anything from you. So we would show you the amount of mortgage interest you were going to have to pay in that $100,000. And people's mouths would drop to the floor. They would say, what are you talking about? Oh, and they would get afraid. And then they'd come back, that back a day or two later and say, okay, we, we've got our, our head around it. We're willing to accept it. If we showed them today all the little tiny, tiny bit of interest you have to pay, they would be jumping up and down with joy. And those talking about a debt jubilee or how the debt to GDP ratio is this or the income to, to debt ratio to mortgage debt ratio is this or the house price to debt ratio is this, they're measuring debt differently than we measure debt. We measure debt the same way that you, Nicole, would measure debt. You don't measure debt based on what the price of your house is. You measure debt on how much of your income you are committing to the purchase of that house before that house is paid off. It's a totally different calculation. It's not even remotely similar. But those talking debt, you believe, aren't making the difference. They're believing 
that you, you owe so much money in mortgage, it's so many times your income. Well, that's because they're measuring debt to income totally different than how homeowners measure, have measured debt to income throughout history. There's a reason why the gross debt service ratio was always safe at around 32%. There's a reason why. It doesn't matter what the price of the house is. As long as your gross, gross debt service ratio was okay, you don't have to worry. There was far more risk in 1990 when interest rates went from 9.97%. So what happened, what caused the previous housing crash in uh, 1990 was the uh, government, the, the Bank of Canada raised rate, rates by 0.75%, okay? That changed everything overnight the moment they did it. Within, as soon as all of the existing pre-approved mortgages with a rate lock guarantee were taken off the books, your housing market started to collapse. They started to collapse for this reason, the same reason that we've been recording falling sales while the Canadian real estate is up, uh, reporting record sales. The moment interest rates rise, fewer and fewer people can buy homes. There has not been a single housing market from 1980 through till today that has withstand, withstood even level rates. None have withstood increasing rates, and none have withstood even a level interest rate. That's what you need to focus on, Nicole. The debt jubilee is an artificial belief of people who aren't trained in measuring homeownership debt. They don't know the strategies that previous generations of home buyers have employed when they had to employ them. When interest rates hit 20 per, in the 20% range in the early 80s, the only way that you could maintain your home was that if you went back to the bank and you increased the amortization period. You didn't want to do it, but you had no choice. You wanted to keep your house. You didn't want to lose your house. And you wanted to be able to maintain things because you weren't getting enough of a job increase to cover a 21% mortgage. So you increased your amortization back up to 25 years. And then when things changed again, because no economy can withstand that, those people again renewed their mortgages, but then drastically dropped their amortization schedule. So there's the only people who are talking about a debt jubilee are people who haven't studied how homeowners interact with their mortgage debt. It's it's only from people who haven't worked with hundreds and thousands of families and you've watched what they've done over time. They can be as prominent, which to me, generally speaking, the most prominent are the ones with the biggest voice, who generally speak are the ones as sales reps who have the least to gain. I mean, you do not see a high-performing sales rep in the province of Ontario on television at any time, okay? The, you do not see any of the top 100 real estate agents in Ontario ever, ever going near a TV camera because they have too much to lose. You see a lot of real estate agents go, who go before a TV camera who are hoping to cash in on the fact that these skilled, knowledgeable realtors won't go on television. That's how these opinions are formed. And that's why this debt jubilee you've mentioned is simply a myth. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross Cottages, or cabins, as they're called in some parts of Canada, like here in B.C., where you're in a mountain, so it wouldn't be right to call it a cottage. It's a cabin. Well, anyway, they're now being cited for the same type of price increases that were first reported in the big cities, then the outer cities and burbs, and finally, cities all over. Sue from Peterborough asked, 
cottages are going through the roof right now around Peterborough. Do you think they're a good investment? Okay, so you would. I think she's quoting because there was, but it was a report out from Royal LePage from Phil Soper, Phil Joker, um, uh, last week, where he said about cottage country, and he was trying to give again an opinion of why you're seeing this now. Phil wasn't around when when the interior housing correction happened last time. He he came in just after that, and Royal LePage at the time was they you know they were they were the number one name in in the real estate brokerage industry at the time of the last housing correction. It was actually the last housing correction in Ontario that moved Royal LePage uh, down the hierarchy of real estate brokerages in this country, uh, which they've never recovered from. Uh, he, what he doesn't understand is that this has happened before, folks. There was a time when everybody talked in Ontario, where everybody talked about Wayne Gretzky, John Candy, Goldie Hawn, and, and Kurt Russell, celebrities all moving up to Muskoka, and they were driving the price of Muskoka. Muskoka was going to be the new Malibu of uh, North America. Well, of course, the housing correction hit, and, of course, as it turns out, last into the game, first one to get nailed big time. And they get nailed worse than anyone. And that's what cottage countries, have, cottage and cabins, have shown you. Cottages and cabins are purchased as secondary residences or part-time residences. Don't listen to this work-from-home nonsense. People have intermittent Internet access uh, in a lot of cottages and cabins. Uh, they've never lived through a winter in a cottage and cabin, and they have no realities about getting their kids to school um, and the other plethora of items that living in a cottage and cabin uh, community uh, requires. What happened in the 1990s was the biggest house price declines happened in cottage country. It happened in Muskoka. Uh, it, it was staggering, the amount of loss. Like, we saw a 50% drop in uh, in urban areas here in the GTA, but you saw like 70, 80 percent losses in Muskoka, uh, the, the prime um, cottage country of uh, of North America, Muskoka, like it really is. Um, that's just what happens. You see, what happened in Toronto first with these record year over year announced house price gains by the, your local MLS happened in the outer cities a little bit later. Happened in cities like Guelph, Kitchener-Waterloo, London, even later. That's why we're cities, the city of Toronto and cities closer to Toronto were only reporting their sales, sales increases had dropped to maybe 10% year over year, was the same time that London and Terry was reporting a 30% gain. Well, now we're into the cottage country, the final stage of house price illusion that happens, recreational properties. Now, you're going to hear all those with opinions stating that this is work from home. This is transformational. This is a, a new a new decision on a life choice. Well, all of a sudden the housing market starts to correcting and there is no longer any money to buy cottage properties, cabins, because you need equity in your existing home that you can leverage to buy those cottages and cabins. Well, Ross, these people are, are moving from Toronto and they're moving there. That's true. But what happens when people want to move back? You need people with money who are able to buy those homes. And that money is evaporating every day in a housing correction. That's why those properties become fall to the lowest trading pool. Now, you have to remember, in certain parts of this country, cottages and cabins are now uber luxury homes. These, these are not the cottages and cabins of 30 years ago in the, in these primaries. I'm, again, I'll, I'll, I'll cite Muskoka again. The, the cottages that are in Muskoka now are mansions. I mean, how they even got zoning approval, you have to question in, uh, in the climate that we have today. How, how could they ever build these huge houses on these pristine lakes? I have no idea, but, but it's gone on. So even if you take a, million dollar drop that is a million dollars of profit that that property uh has lost it's going to be selling way way below its replacement cost you couldn't build it 
That's the kind of loss that we're talking about. Peterborough, which is one of the, you know, it's a little bit outside of the, the prime Muskoka area. Um, that's what you're seeing now. Because once Muskoka's filled, then it's the outer perimeter cottages, cottage country, cabin country that gets bought up. They are the final, final stage. Folks, everything works in cycles with housing markets. Hopefully, today's show, we have explained repeatedly over and over again how opinions and not data are driving the conversation about housing. What, what I would ask your listeners is this. Apply the scientific method to anything that you hear or think about housing or home ownership. See the data. Don't just listen to what someone says and believe it. Demand proof. When you hear someone talk about a debt jubilee, okay, provide us proof. I just showed you how you don't have to worry about it, even with a historic increase in uh, interest charges being added to your mortgage. You don't have to. All you do is you play with your amortization period. Will governments drop increase amortizations back to 30 years to stave off a housing correction? Will governments increase amortizations to 40 years to stave off a housing correction? Will government drop down payments back down to zero to stave off a housing housing correction? No, because all of these opinions that have dominated the minds of those who set policy over the last seven years are now just that. It's a mindset of the opinion. There is no scientific mathematical proof to support it, but it's believed. There is no way that a government is going to say, oh, we know we need to do this. We heard Polos. We heard Polos on television last week. Well, if, uh, if, uh, house price gains is what it takes, uh, because of low interest rates, uh, to stave off a recession, so be it. Well, of course the man who himself did that in 2013, the moment he took the helms of, of Bank of Canada, is gonna be pontificating on the exact same nonsense he enacted over his time in uh, at the leadership of the bank he really truly believes it's okay to harm canadian families for the sake of the canadian economy he is now on the record admitting he is willing to harm you finance he is willing to wipe you out financially if it makes gdp look better if it makes the government look better he thinks so lowly of you he believes you are so stupid not only is he going to do it and did he do it but he's going to tell you right to your face that that's what he's doing and you're too stupid to hear what he's saying that's what he believes well i'll tell you this i know the listeners to this show are not that stupid i know that homeowners in general are not that stupid and i know that canadian families are not they're way smarter than mr polaz or tiff macklin are or Carney, for that matter, before him. They are way smarter because it shows in the data. They are moving months before the Bank of Canada is even clued in to what's going on. They're so far, they're so smarter than the Bank of Canada, so smarter than uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada, that they're moving a half a year, eight months before the bank even knows what's going on. And you saw that, folks, when you heard about inventory shortage last year the moment your realtors start to talk about inventory shortage it means the canadian homeowner already knows the jig is up and the canadian homeowner is already moving we're not going to sell our house and get caught we're going to wait no we're not going to move this year we're going to wait the canadian homeowner the canadian and family is far far smarter than any Bank of Canada governor or any CMHC economist or any economist out there. They're far, far smarter, which also happens to be a reason why you don't have to worry about debt jubilee and why $700,000 sales and a $665,000 average selling price in 2021 is not math that actually works. Well, it's always nice to get financial advice from people who get tax-free allowances at account for about half their salary. They don't even live in the real economy. What do they know? Uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> it, hey, look, Jim, 10 years ago, 
I was cl- I was clueless. Ten years, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've got to come clean. Ten years ago, I was clueless. I had no idea that the the Bank of Canada acted the way that it did. I knew I know the Canadian banks acted the way that they did on it, playing the interest rates with the Canadian home buyers, but I ne- had no idea where uh, the Bank of Canada was. I had no idea how incompetent CMHC was. I had no idea that economists. Like David Rosenberg, I heard him today. Oh yeah, the Canadian housing bubble looks like sneakily looks like it's the U.S. housing bubble. Oh, so it's now February of 2021. The Canadian Real Estate Association announces the average selling price is 607, and now you say all of a sudden there's a housing bubble, or now it's resembling the American housing bubble. How about how house prices inflate and how prices deflate? over the last 40 years. If you believe there's a housing bubble, tell us what your number is. Tell us the exact number, the amount of bubble that's in the market. If you believe at the end of the year, the Canadian real estate is going to be a 665,000, tell us how much of that 665,000 is bubble to the thousand dollars. I don't need you to be to the hundred or to the dollar like we are. I need you to tell me just to a thousand bucks. How much of that is, is housing bubble? Because if you're making that comment and you get on television and people listen to you, then that means you know what the amount of the housing bubble was in the United States when it happened. You know exactly how many thousands of dollars their housing bubble was measured before the correction started to take place. Of course, he doesn't have those numbers because a housing bubble index requires a high degree of data acquisition and knowledge of the housing market to be able to calculate. There's something that's called a sustainable price, and there's called the surplus. The surplus measures your housing bubble. The surplus is caused by MLS systems, magic math. The sustainable price is the smart price. The Canadians actually know what their house is worth. They may think their house is worth more today, but they're prepared for the sustainable price in the future. If, if, if Mr. Rosenberg can measure a housing bubble, give us your number. Don't go on television saying, oh, the Canadian is looking sneakily like the American housing bubble without giving a number. Give me the number because everything else is just your uninformed opinion. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross, or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.